Hey there, beautiful friends. Welcome to my channel. I'm really glad you're here. So for the last four videos, we've been exploring names, words, frames, and perspectives. We've been spending time examining how the way we think about or refer to things affects our interaction with the world. And we've discussed how the process of making personal and collective sense of things is a necessary and valuable task, but also one which has some limitations and dangers that we should pay careful attention to so that we can better combat our insecurities while remaining humble about all the growing and learning we still have to do. If you missed those videos, you can catch them in the new playlist called Naming and Framing. But today's video will mark something of a new direction, an attempt to recognize that while our frames are always limited, they are also an unavoidable part of life. We can't just stop making conclusions or decisions, but we can strive to make better ones, more educated ones, more inclusive and honest ones. And that's where we'll begin today, in pursuit of a greater degree of self-honesty. So today I'll be offering some more personal reflection and stories which have helped me become more comfortable in my life by seeing things with a wider frame, by holding multiple stories, and by increasing my capacity for gracious self-honesty. So I'll begin with a story from my coming out, or like my second or third coming out. <laughs> for context, I'm of the opinion that coming out is not really something you do one time, but is a lifelong posture of continuing to come out as you meet new people, but also as you come to better understand yourself and rearrange the labels and frames you use for your self-understanding. But in this case, the story I'll be sharing is about the time I first considered that I might not have been a cisgender dude. So I was sitting in a queer support slash resistance group, which at this moment in my undergrad life, I was no stranger to, but I was usually sitting on the facilitation side of things. So I would set the room, introduce myself, and then welcome anyone who felt comfy to share their name, pronouns, and whatever else they wanted with the group. But being in the role of facilitator, I was never really participating in the space in the same way. I was always working to hold space for others, but was not accustomed to having space held for me. I had never really stopped to consider how I actually wanted to describe myself. <laughs> I always just gave the same introduction spiel and passed it on to the next person. But on this particular time, that changed. So, as the circle of introductions passed closer to me, I was confused to find that I was really anxious to introduce myself. I wasn't sure why, I had a script I was very accustomed to sticking to, but for the first time, I found myself suddenly panicked that my pronouns didn't feel quite right, that my name felt a little off, that in a space where I was allowed and encouraged to introduce myself in a way that I felt most comfortable to me, rather than by my legal name or socially assigned pronouns, I felt this anxiety that if I simply said, my name is Josh and I use he, him pronouns, that to this room full of mostly strangers, there would probably be some assumptions about me that didn't hold true for my perception of myself. So the circle came around to me, I took a deep breath and I said, hi, my name is Josh and I use he, him pronouns. <laughs> and then I genuinely don't remember the rest of the meeting because I was trapped on a loop in my own mind, reeling over how slightly wrong it felt, but totally uncertain what it could even look like to use a different name or pronouns. Mind you, it took an additional four months before I would even attempt using they them pronouns, about eight months before I started using them regularly, a year before I would test run a new name, and like the better part of two years before my name would be legally changed. But it was in this moment of unexpected anxiety and uncertainty that I would first give voice to the very possibility that the words and names which people used to refer to me did not feel quite right and did not communicate the things I actually felt about myself. A lot of the steps I took toward doing the things that would ultimately save my life and unearth me from the crushing weight of other people's expectations would happen in much the same way. If I could only pick one term to describe the process of coming out to myself and to others as trans, it would probably be self-effacing. Even when I finally found the strength to offer they them pronouns, it was always quickly followed with, but it's totally okay if you don't get them right, I don't care. 
which could not have been farther from the truth. But simply because I hadn't felt dysphoric about he, him pronouns for my whole life, or rather was not given any other option, was not made to feel safe or encouraged to articulate myself in any other way, I convinced myself that there was no way that something I had grown so accustomed to could possibly hurt me. And every change I would make to continue to give myself more agency over my own expression, over my own life, was clouded by the same overwhelming sense of doubt and insecurity. I would tentatively dip my toe into the water of something euphoric or exciting while screaming to myself and anyone who could hear me that I wasn't really going to go swimming, I was just testing the water. <laughs> and I wish I could say that no one cared, but unfortunately, a lot of people who really loved and supported me at the time listened to my screams because I downplayed how important and exciting it was for me to be exploring myself in this way, it made it easier for other people around me to downplay it too, which only affirmed a lot of my fears that this was all just a delusion, that this wasn't a real part of myself, or that I could go back to pretending to be a cis dude anytime I wanted or needed to. In hindsight, a significant amount of the first two years of my coming out were marked with me working through my own misplaced misogyny and transphobia. While I can now confidently say that being misgendered feels disappointing and alienating, that there are few better decisions I made for my mental health than getting on estrogen, and that my name is Joss and not anything else unless I decide so, these were all things that I was scared and quite paralyzed to admit were true for me just a few years ago. In my earliest stages of coming out to myself, I was never brave enough to identify as femme in any way. I was only barely found the strength to say that masculinity didn't quite feel comfy to me, that I was curious about other possibilities, and that I might sorta kinda maybe need to make some changes in my life if it wasn't too much of an inconvenience to the people around me, and I was super sorry if this was hard or confusing, because it was hard and confusing for me too. But I don't judge myself for this timidity anymore. Or I try not to. I have come to learn that brave decisions almost rarely feel brave when you're making them. They more often just feel like fighting for your survival. And as all the people around me were working to better understand transness and undo their own transphobia, I was also undoing my own transphobia. And what I discovered was that I had oceans worth of internalized self-hatred for every drop of curiosity or uncertainty expressed by the people around me. For as much as anyone else was struggling with my transition, I was plagued by it, resisting it, kicking and screaming, hoping that things could just go back to being comfy like they were before I noticed how much pain I was feeling. Hoping that wherever I landed wouldn't actually require too much work or change. And this leads us to a story I would like to share that I first encountered around this time, or perhaps a little sooner. And it's a Taoist parable about a farmer. It's been told a lot of different ways, but it is often called who knows what is good and what is bad, and I'll just give you my own recounting of it. So there's a poor farmer who one day loses their only horse. It just runs off into the sunset. Their neighbors catch wind of this and come to console them, but they just reply, who knows what's good or bad? A few days later, the horse returns, but along with it comes several other wild, beautiful horses. Their neighbors, seeing this, come to congratulate them on their amazing fortune, but the farmer just replies, who knows what's good or bad. The next day, the farmer and their son are out working with the horses, trying to tame them, when one particularly wild one bucks the farmer's son, breaking his leg. The neighbors come again to console such a tragedy, but the farmer replies, who knows what's good or bad. A few weeks later, the farmer's country goes to war, and many of the neighboring farmer's sons are sent off to risk their lives, but the farmer's son is spared because of his broken leg. The neighbors come again and remark on the farmer's unexpected fortune, but the farmer just replies, who knows what's good or bad. And the story usually stops there, but it could continue like that indefinitely. 
The point of the parable is that good and bad depend a great deal on the timing and framing of a thing. Because we cannot see the details of the future, and because none of us have complete perspective, in every experience of our lives, there will be unexpected fortune as well as tragic difficulties. And sometimes, something which we cannot fathom to be anything other than a total win or a total loss in time and context reveal itself to be more complicated than we initially perceived. This parable makes a lot of sense of the difficulty I experienced in my own lengthy and oscillating coming out process. Many of those things which I was most afraid of, which I could only approach with timidity and constant self-effacing, which I could not imagine as anything other than bad, scary, or hard things, were the very things that continued to give me strength and help build confidence as I evolved in my articulation of myself. The path to becoming who I am today was never clearly paved, and I have often joked that if I could hop in a time machine and visit myself even five years ago, there's an incredibly likely chance that past me wouldn't even recognize who I have become. I have a really solid suspicion that this holds true for a lot of people who undergo substantive life transformations. That we can never imagine the things we will learn or the people we will become as a result of life's winding journey. But I think what my journey of transness has made perhaps uniquely clear for me is the ways in which even those sources of support or privilege, which I thought I could never live without, really just held me back. Growing up socialized as an educated, cishet, white Christian in Texas gave me a picture of success, of self-worth, of my expected place in the world that ultimately made it significantly harder for me to give voice to the things which I really felt, to the vision of the world I wanted to shape, and the person I wanted to become. I was afraid of letting down my friends and family, sure, but more than that, as I came out, I was constantly grieving a perceived failure within myself. I felt like I was just too weak to live into the potential that everyone else had assured me would come from my life looking a certain way, and was terrified of what my life would become as I gave up all this so-called privilege and social potential. And many of the things which I desperately clung to, believing they would save me from myself, ultimately caused me to continue speaking and thinking in ways that were personally violent and transphobic, resulting in wounds I am still working to undo. I'm not going to paint some one-sided rosy picture of my life now. I have lost a lot of the things I was afraid of letting go of. I have gone from once upon a time being a golden child charismatic prom king to being harassed by strangers on the street and struggling to make ends meet in a way that doesn't totally destroy my sense of self-worth. And I don't believe all of this is strictly a result of my transness, but becoming more comfy in my body has definitely resulted in many other people becoming less comfortable with me and less trusting of what I have to say. But what I have learned is that from my own personal perspective, many of the things which other people were most proud of me for actually ended up contributing to me feeling deeply isolated and afraid of letting people down. While the aspects of my life that have become materially most difficult have helped shape me into someone who is more content, more comfortable in my own body, more honest in my engagement of others, more aware of my personal needs and boundaries, and more at home in my own life. In other words, who can say what is good and what is bad? So I'll leave you with three questions for personal reflection and contemplation so that you can make better sense of what I've shared today in light of your own life and hopefully think more deeply about our limited ability to discern what is good and what is bad. First, think of a time where you worked hard to get something you wanted, where you succeeded in a way you were really proud of or where you received praise or affirmation for some part of yourself or your accomplishments. With the perspective you have gained since then, what are some consequences or costs from this good that you may have never stopped to consider? Second, think of one of the hardest things you have overcome, 
one of the most difficult times in your life that you are grateful it's over? What is something you learned or some way that experience shaped you that you were thankful for? And last, consider how you feel about your life right now. Pay careful attention to the way you have been thinking about or describing this period to yourself or to others. What is another way of framing this moment in your life which illuminates those aspects which you have paid less attention to? In other words, what are other ways you could think about or describe this same experience? If you enjoyed today's video or it meant something to you, please give it a thumbs up and click subscribe. Your support means a great deal to me as I want to provide reflections which speak to you. And if you're feeling brave and vulnerable enough to share any response you had to today's questions, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Otherwise, thank you for watching. I wish you peace and perspective. I love you all as I love myself, as we are part of the same world. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. If you would like to know more about me or this channel, you can find that video right here. And if you would like to check out my first series of videos on naming and framing, you can find that playlist right here.